Hey everyone, thanks for your time. One of the main Artemis 2 milestones that we've been watching for all year finally occurred this last week with Mobile Launcher 1 rolling into the vehicle assembly building. In this video, I'll go over the rollback and review the work completed at Launchpad 39B over the past year. The Artemis 2 schedule isn't clear, so this rollback isn't necessarily the signal that stacking is close to beginning that we once thought it was. I'll take a look at what we know and don't know about what happens for the rest of the year for Artemis 2, and there was also some more Starship schedule drama this past week. It's more Starship schedule drama rather than launch drama, but maybe another prototype launch isn't as far away now. First, let's focus on the mobile launcher rollback details. Exploration Ground Systems rolled Mobile Launcher 1 from Pad 39B back to the Vehicle Assembly Building in the early morning on Thursday, October 3rd. Crawler Transporter 2 stopped for the day in front of High Bay 3, and then early the next day, October 4th, the work crews completed the move. The crew access arm is retracted and locked for almost all of the roll, but it needs to be extended inside the High Bay. That was done first, and then the ML was rolled into High Bay 3 to get ready to stack the Artemis 2 vehicle for launch. The ML returns to the VAB area for the first time since August 2023, and into the VAB for the first time since January 2023. Since that time, ML1 was upgraded to support crewed Orion SLS launches that begin with Artemis 2. The ML was last returned from Pad 39B to the VAB on December 8th and 9th of 2022, about three weeks after the Artemis 1 launch, for a little post-launch refurbishment, and then it was moved outside to the West Park site in early January 2023. More extensive refurbishment and repair was done outside at the West Park site, in parallel with some of the physical modifications to the umbilical tower for installation of the emergency egress system. Upgrading the mobile launcher to support crewed Orion SLS launches was long planned in between Artemis 1 and 2, along with whatever refurbishment was necessary from the effects of the Artemis 1 launch. The NASA Inspector General IG-24-011 report provided some additional detail about damage that needed to be fixed. A typical post-launch media activity is for photographers to go to the pad area to pick up their remotely set cameras. When that was delayed multiple times and longer than typical, there were questions about launch damage to the ML and the pad after Artemis 1. In the days immediately after that launch, NASA reported damage to pneumatic lines and that the elevator doors were blown off, which exposed the elevator system to additional damage as SLS climbed away. The OIG report noted that the launch broke and disconnected some of the pneumatic line tubing on the ML, which prevented the washdown system from operating. That amplified the damage effects. Some pneumatics didn't work, which blocked the washdown system from washing away the coating of corrosive SRB exhaust residue on a lot of the lines. Instead of a 35-minute washdown occurring shortly after launch, the manual washdowns didn't start until 5 days after launch and took 11 days to complete, and during that time more extensive corrosion of the lines occurred. Repairs and replacement of those lines started while the ML was at the park site in the first half of 2023, but the OIG noted those continued during the long stay out at the pad. In mid-August 2023, the ML was rolled straight from the West Park site out to pad 39B to complete emergency egress system installations and do a bunch of joint verification and validation testing between the pad systems and the mobile launcher. A series of integrated systems verification and validation tests were conducted during the 14 months or so the ML stayed out at the pad. This NASA graphic outlines the testing categories, which included upgrades not only to the emergency egress system, but also to the ignition overpressure protection and sound suppression water system, the environmental control system, high-speed cameras that image the launch, cryogenic propellant loading and management, the crew access arm, and more. The Exploration Ground Systems and Contractor Launch Team conducted the tests, and the Artemis II flight crew participated in one day of launch simulation during this period, with additional launch day test runs planned in the future. Now that the ML is hard down on the pedestals in High Bay 3, EGS Integrated Operations will prepare both the Mobile Launcher and High Bay 3 to support stacking the Artemis II vehicle, beginning with the SLS Solid Rocket Boosters followed by the cryogenic stages and connecting adapters. 
Those stacking preparations are expected to take around three to four weeks, and somewhere towards the end of that period, EGS would have a review meeting to see if everyone involved is ready to start stacking. When I spoke with EGS Senior Vehicle Operations Manager Cliff Lanham back in late August, he talked about the stacking preparations, the timing of a stacking checkpoint meeting, and how that would work. So we do have a checkpoint. Um, it's uh, a meeting that we get together anywhere from two to four weeks ahead of stacking, where it's um, multi-program attended, um, chaired by EGS. And um, at that point is where we would make that decision um, based on you know any other factors that may be out there to go ahead and get into the um, stacking of the boosters. Would you expect that the checkpoint meeting would occur after the after the mobile launchers back in the VAB? Yes, we do have. Um, so when the mobile launcher does get back to the VAB, we do have some work to do in preparation for the stacking. And so the teams have been focused on getting, uh, you know, our paper ready, um, getting, um, you know, the teams ready so that when the mobile launcher does make it into the VAB, we will be ready to go. Um, Again, we have roughly, you know, three, three to four weeks of work there to be ready for stacking. And um, so we'll be focused on that. And in that interim period, as we wrap up that um, ML preparation work is when we would look to, to uh, have that review to say, okay, we're going to get ready to go stack. Is everybody good? So three to four weeks would project to the end of this month, October. But NASA has said that it wants to decide what to do with the Orion base heat shield before stacking begins. I've gone over the Orion heat shield decision many times in the past month or so. At this point, we're waiting to hear an announcement of that decision. Right now, we don't know if the decision is made, and we don't know when an announcement might happen. The crawler transporter rolled out to pad 39B on September 25th, with NASA KSC Public Affairs reporting that during the roll, the CT2 odometer went over 2,500 miles since construction was completed in 1965. Early on the morning of October 1st, the CT rolled inside the pad gate, up the incline, and under the mobile launcher as a part of rollback preparations. Pictures taken on that day provided good views of the mobile launcher, including the part of the contingency pad access system that we'd heard about in late August. During the interview with Cliff Lanham, he said that the overall system is still being designed, but that EGS wanted to get the piece that needed to be welded to the umbilical tower done outside before the rollback. So, uh, yeah, you're talking about the uh, contingency pad access system, if you will. Um, so right now, what we've been focused on is the uh, designs to um, do what we call the hot work, you know, welding um, interfaces onto the mobile launcher. Um, so that there would be have to be no welding um, in the VAB while we're stacking boosters. So um, we're nearing completion on that work um, here in the next couple of weeks. Um, and then the design side, you know, so that, that piece will be behind us, but then the actual design it, um, just hit a uh, basically a, uh, a preliminary uh, level uh, recently, and um, they'll be looking to finish up the design by the end of the year. And then uh, we'll get into building up the, uh, the, the structure. So um, that's kind of where we are with the hardware. Uh, you know, the teams are still looking at um, how the contingency access would be used in terms of, um, you know, if we had to use it at the pad, what are those timelines going to look like? So they're working through that. Um, you know, the, the idea here would be if we rolled out and we missed our primary launch attempt and our uh, flight termination system were to expire, we could go reset that with this system. So um, that's where we are. That's what, um, you know, kind of where we're headed. Uh, so that I beam that was welded to the umbilical tower was easier to spot in the up close pictures taken on October 1st. You can see it sticks outside the tower frame above the core stage inner tank umbilical and just below the retracted vehicle stabilizer arms. There was another view of that in the one image taken up on the High Bay 3 platforms after the mobile launcher was rolled into the integration cell. I went into some of the background of this set of platforms that would be used at the pad in a video shortly after the interview with Mr. Lanham. During the week, KSC Public Affairs also posted still images and video taken when the Artemis II SLS core stage, 
Core Stage 2, was lifted off of its transportation carrier equipment by two of the VAB cranes to get weight and center of gravity readings. The 175-ton crane and one of the two 325-ton cranes were attached to lift points on the engine section and the inner tank at the forward SRB attach fittings. The stage was disconnected from the transportation carrier hardware interface structures, and then the cranes lifted the stage up about six inches, enough to fully transfer the load from the transportation carrier to the cranes. As the social media post notes, the procedure was done twice to get accurate measurements. This lift was a little different than the one that will eventually be used for stacking. In that case, the 175-ton crane will be attached in the same location, but the 325-ton crane will be attached to a lift spider installed on the forward end of the stage, the top flange of the forward skirt. The rollback of Mobile Launcher 1 to VAB High Bay 3 was one of the watch items for Artemis 2, and now that it's complete, let's sort of quickly review the big picture. The Mobile Launcher joins the SLS Core Stage and Launch Vehicle Stage Adapter inside the VAB. The booster segments are waiting across the street in the Rotation Processing and Surge Facility, and the Interim Cryogenic Propulsion Stage is only a drive across the Banana River on the NASA Causeway away from the Kennedy Space Center. All the SLS elements needed to do a tanking test without Orion are ready to proceed into stacking, and the mobile launcher should be ready in the next handful of weeks. And here's what the watch items list looks like now. Whether or not NASA goes forward with plans to launch Artemis II in September of next year, now only 11 months away, depends on what the space agency decides to do with the Orion base heat shield. In theory, stacking might be able to begin in about a month or so, but we still don't have any guidance on when that decision might happen or when it might be announced. And at least right now, the word remains that stacking will not begin until after the heat shield decision. There was a little more drama with the potential launch date for Starship Flight Test 5 over the past few days. Tank watchers noticed that the U.S. Coast Guard posted a notice to mariners for Starship launch trajectories out of Boca Chica beginning on October 12th and including backup dates running through October 19th. This would be a big change from the time frame that the Federal Aviation Administration said they could finish a launch license, which was no earlier than November 26th. That's a difference of over six weeks, long enough to make a big schedule difference for SpaceX and for minority starship investor NASA with their Artemis lunar landing plans. After the NOTMAR for Coast Guard District 8 was published during the week, the FAA responded to several media inquiries. The FAA responded to Adrian Beal with NSF that their statement from September 11th still stands, which said that a final license determination wasn't expected until late November. Brandon Lingle with the San Antonio News Express reported in his story on October 3rd that an FAA spokesman said that a license in the next two weeks is, quote, not happening, unquote. So it seems like there's a disconnect, or maybe multiple disconnects, between some of the different parties in this situation. Like the other programs, Starship is behind schedule for a Artemis III lunar landing mission in September 2026. This next flight test won't directly address Artemis objectives, but six weeks might end up being the difference between the first big Artemis technology demonstration, the ship-to-ship -ship propellant transfer demo, being flown next year in 2025 or not. We'll just have to stay tuned, so to speak, and see where the launch date moves, if at all. But maybe there's now a chance of a launch before Thanksgiving. In other news and notes from the past week, the Gateway program posted a couple of images of the habitation and logistics outpost structure taken back in July. These images, courtesy of Talus Alenia Space Italy, were taken of the HALO structure in a static load test stand. During the recent late August NASA Advisory Council meeting, NASA exploration leadership had noted that the static load testing was complete. A proof pressure test still needs to be completed before the structure can be transported from Italy to Gilbert, Arizona, where prime contractor Northrop Grumman will outfit the module for flight. There was a good note of context in a blog by the European Space Agency about the Artemis III Orion service module, also about proof pressure testing. 
The two main elements, the European service module and the crew module adapter, were recently bolted together to begin integration and testing at the Kennedy Space Center. After the bolting is completed, the mated assembly will move to the clean room for orbital tube welding, and the blog says, quote, the combined service module will undergo rigorous proof pressure testing to confirm that all systems are leak proof and to ensure a secure connection before the spacecraft moves on to further assembly stages, unquote. That's an important milestone to note, as non-destructive evaluation or NDE inspections of the welds will be made before and after they are proof tested. That is one of the milestones that will need to be completed before the service module is ready for its initial power on or IPO milestone currently forecast for next spring. And another Artemis 3 production note from a Boeing article that was published a week ago Friday on September 27th. Following delivery of the engine section boat tail to KSC for attachment to the bottom of the core stage three engine section, that article noted that quote, Remaining elements of CS3 are expected to be delivered to KSC in 2025, unquote. When that might be in 2025 leaves open the question of whether the stage as a whole could be completed by the end of 2025. If the upper four-fifths of the stage aren't delivered until the end of 2025, then core stage 3 wouldn't be completed until 2026. If the four-fifths arrives at KSC earlier in 2025, and the engine section standalone outfitting or integration can also be completed earlier in 2025, then maybe it's still possible for Boeing to complete production within the 2025 calendar year. The third quarter of this calendar year just ended, and I went through the situation for Artemis 3 and 4 in more detail in the quarterly review video last week. These news and notes add some additional context and detail, but the Artemis II and Starship situation are the biggest news items of the week. As the target date for Artemis III gets closer and closer, those two big flight tests scheduled for 2025 have moved up the watch item list for Artemis III. Over the past couple of months, production milestones for the Artemis III, Orion, and SLS hardware have provided enough breadcrumbs to get some sense of that situation. At least based on what we've seen and what's been reported recently, that production is a little lower on the list. The Orion base heat shield decision will have an impact on the Artemis III schedule all by itself, but the biggest impact on Orion and SLS readiness is likely to remain when the Artemis II test flight flies. For the Starship propellant transfer demo from one ship to another in Earth orbit, the timing of that remains a question mark, and at this point is one of the biggest question marks besides Artemis II. SpaceX is making self-evident progress with each Starship prototype and each flight test, but we don't know where they are on the path to get to the technology demonstrations that are crucial to Artemis in general and Artemis III in particular. Thanks for watching. Click on the like button if you found this video informative.